Mark chapter 14 is where we're at this morning. A very fitting sermon, I do believe. Mark 14. We're going to read verses 32 down through verses 36, but the sermon will uh, pertain to verses 35 and 36. Title of the message this morning is Have It Your Way. Have It Your Way. Will you stand with me as we read the scriptures this morning? Verse 32 of Mark 14 says, Then they, that's the disciples and Jesus, came to a place which is called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him and began to be troubled and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch. And here's where the sermon picks up for today. Verse 35. He went a little farther and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, this hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. But nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Let's pray together this morning. Lord Jesus, I think I speak for pretty much everybody in this congregation when I say that we've all had moments, maybe even seasons of our lives where we want it our way. Lord, I pray this morning that we will surrender to your way. Help us to want what you want and help our hearts to be like yours. May your word be read, may it be preached, may it be heard, and may it be obeyed today in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. My guess is as soon as I told you the title of the sermon was Have It Your Way, you immediately thought Burger King, right? Burger King is without a doubt one of my favorite fast food joints, probably my favorite, not one of, but probably my favorite. My wife hates it. We're still praying that she'll get saved, but she hates it. And so when I'm out and about by myself, that's when I have to get my Burger King fix because I'm not getting it if she's with me. It's just not happening. For, you, for those of you who know me, you know if I love to fish. And if I'm going to Lake Norman nine times out of ten, especially if I'm by myself, I'm stopping at the Burger King at 150 and 16 there in the Denver area. I'm stopping there every time. But Burger King has a slogan that says, have it your way. And Burger King actually uh, beat the other fast food restaurants to this idea of allowing you to determine how you get your order. Instead of walking in and saying, I'll have a Happy Meal, and they just make it and give it to you. Instead of walking in and saying, I'll have a number one, and they just make it and give it to you. Burger King lets you decide if you want it plain, if you want it large, if you want it with ketchup, without, with onions, without. They let you decide how you want it. Do you know to this day, me and Burger King, we've only had one issue in our, my whole life. Me and Burger King have no problems. You know why? They always do what I ask them to do. Now, we would have some issues if I walk into Burger King and say, hey, I'd like a BK King, make it large fry, make it large sweet tea. And they look at me and say, no, nah, it's just chicken nuggets today, bud. That's all you're getting. Well, then we would have a problem. Why? Because then they would be lying. I'm not getting it my way. They're determining that I got to do it their way. Well, the truth is that with the exception of one little bump in the road during COVID, me and Burger King have never had an issue. Now, we had an issue one time in, in COVID, but we kissed and made up, and now we're, we're good again. But Burger King and I would have a problem. If I walk in and place my order and they say, no, that's not how you can have it, then I would say, well, then your slogan of have it your way is wrong. But you know what I've noticed about Christianity? Is a whole lot of people want to go to God and say, God, I want it my way. Instead of saying, God, have it your way. And this morning we come to a text of Jesus surrendering to this concept of saying, God the Father, have it your way. Because all of us, to be honest, we want it our way. We arrive at the place in the scripture where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. In just a few moments, he's going to be handed over, sold out, and he's going to make his way to the cross. So in his last moments before the cross, we find him in the Garden of Gethsemane praying, laboring over prayer, praying hard. And we see him praying and struggling in this concept of prayer of saying, God, here's what I want. But ultimately, I'm surrendering to your way. Here's the main point I want you to see this morning. Most people 
have no problem with God until God changes their plans. Most people are perfectly fine with a concept of a deity or a God until God changes their plans. Until God says, this is how I want it, and you got to surrender to his way. That's when most people run into a problem. You know, spiritual maturity is not so much about Bible knowledge, not so much about church attendance as it is saying, God, here's what I want, here's what you want, and I surrender to your way. Mark 14 brings us to this Passion Week of Easter when Jesus is in the garden laboring and saying, God, I want this cup to pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. God, let this hour pass from me, but not what I will, what your will be done. Jesus shows us here two things theologically to understand about him, that he's fully God and fully man at the same time. That he literally says, God, here's what I want, but I surrender to what you want. We call that hypostatic union, meaning he's fully divine and fully God wrapped into one person who can say, God, here's what my humanity wants and here's what my divinity will surrender to. Church family, you and I must surrender this morning to the will of the Father to say, God, whatever it is you want, help me to want that as well. Too many times, many of us come to Jesus with this concept of wanting what we want. And in this text, we see Jesus in a new light. Up to now, for the last 14 chapters of Mark, this entire calendar year, what have we seen? Jesus in power. Jesus walking amongst the people. Jesus doing miracles. Jesus being baptized. Jesus calling the disciples. Jesus instituting the, all these things. And now we see him in a very different light. We see him agonizing in prayer, on his face in prayer, laboring in prayer, struggling in prayer. We see him in a new light. This puts Jesus in a spot where we haven't seen him before. This puts Jesus in a spot where he's struggling. Like I told you guys a couple of weeks ago, we all like to say what? I'm fine. And nobody ever admits that they're struggling. But we see Jesus here struggling. That Jesus on his face in the garden saying, God, I don't want to go through this. God, I don't want to. But ultimately, I surrender to whatever your will is. God, this is not what I want. But whatever it is you want, help me to want that. Let me give you an illustration. A while back, there was, we were either having a service or a meal or something in the, in the other building. And I was watching from a distance after we were all done. We're just kind of standing around. Everybody's mingling, doing their thing, just chit-chatting. And I noticed two little boys, they were talking, playing, bantering. And it started escalating into what I knew was about to be a fight. And one of them grabbed the other around the neck. Now, I'm not going to call any names because they may be here this morning. So, yeah, that's you, Isaac. I see you on the screen there, bud. But I saw Jace and Isaac playing. And as they were playing, Jace took the leisure or the pleasure of getting Isaac in a chokehold. And he actually, I've got another picture that I don't have up there today. He picks him up off the ground by his neck and Isaac is not happy about this let me just put it put it bluntly for you all right he's not happy about what's going on now I saw this escalating mom and dad are all just playing talking speaking doing whatever and so nobody's really paying attention so I pulled my phone out and I went Doop. and I'm thinking to myself got him so I walked over to where he was at the boys were at and I walked over to him and I said and, and at this point Isaac's kind of teared up because he's like man he's choking me I mean I'd be crying too somebody choked me and Jace is just looking at me all proud. And I walked up and I said, Jace, what'd you do to him? Nothing. Jace, did you choke him? Nope. I said, Jace, do you think you need to apologize to him? No. Do you think I need to go talk to your parents? No. Nope. Do whatever you want to. I didn't do nothing. I said, I'm going to show you something, Jace. So I got down on his level and I pulled out my phone and I showed him this picture. And I said, now, Jace. Do you want to apologize to Isaac? Do you want me to go talk to your parents? Or do you want to go talk to your parents? And Jace just stands there and looks at that picture. And he does one of these. His mom and dad's over here. And he's just standing there frozen. And I can see like in his soul, in his eyes, he's like, I'm stuck. He got me. Like, I can't lie. He's got the proof. I don't want him to tell my mama he's got the proof. 
I got to apologize. I don't want to. I'm stuck and I don't know what to do. I am stuck. I said, Jace, apologize to him. So he apologized to him. I don't think Jay, I don't think Emily and Jason have seen this picture, so spare them the agony. Jace finally apologizes to him. But I saw for a brief moment there was sheer agony on his face of realizing I'm stuck between what I know I need to do and what I want to do. I'm stuck because you got the proof of what I did and I don't want to admit it. And what I need to do, I don't want to do it. I'm stuck. This is exactly how Jesus felt in the garden when he got to Gethsemane to say, Father, here's what I want. Not to go to the cross because it's agonizing. But here's what I want even more is to do whatever you want me to do. So when Jesus got to Gethsemane, he literally goes, God, here's what I want. But I surrender to whatever you want. Just like Jace couldn't say, I'm surrendering. He was stuck. Jesus was stuck here, but Jesus doesn't give in to his flesh. He surrenders to the will of the Father. I want to show you three things from the text this morning very quickly. Number one, I want you to see the pain of Jesus. Number two, I want you to see the prayer of Jesus. And number three, I want you to see the purpose of Jesus. All from verses 35 and 36. In verse 35, the scripture says, Then Jesus went a little farther and he fell on the ground. This is a picture of the pain of Jesus. Now, our state has felt pain this past week like we haven't felt since Hugo, probably. We felt pain in a new way. We felt pain for people we don't even know. They have felt pain in a new way. Everybody has felt it this week. Everybody has been connected or at least a couple of steps removed from somebody who's been affected by this week. And we've all felt this pain. But Jesus here shows a pain that we haven't seen him have. It's the agony of human will and divine will clashing with one another. And Jesus has to surrender to the Father. My question to you this morning, church, is are you willing to say, God, have it your way? Are you willing to say, God, have it your way? Or is the pain of Jesus that we see here, the pain inside of us of saying, God, that's not what I want. I want my way at all costs. If that's the case, don't be surprised when you don't get it. I want to share with you this story. This this happened to me. This has been years ago. But I was helping a family with a funeral. It was a very, very unexpected funeral. It wasn't an elderly or or someone who had been sick for a long time. It was completely out of it out of the blue, unexpected. And this is a very long time ago. But I never forgot this one scene. I walked into their house, and it was just cold. No emotion. I sat down to talk with them about what happened. Cold, emotionless. I did talk to the funeral home, and I got them connected. Went with them to the funeral home. Went with them through the process. Did everything with them, and it's just emotionless they didn't have a grave plot so I went with them to help them find a grave plot they needed to purchase one they didn't have one so I went with them and as we found them a grave plot we're leaving to making our way back to the cars we're probably a hundred yards from where we parked and as we're walking down the road there's just like a little old asphalt covered road we're just walking down it making our way back when out of nowhere the the agony and the heaviness of what happened finally come to a head and the daughter just began to cry uncontrollably and I've never I've seen this one time in my life she bent over and she cried so much there was a literal puddle on the ground of tears a physical puddle that you could step in of tears I mean it was it was it was it was crying like I've never seen before why because the heaviness of the moment could not be avoided. The heaviness of what happened could not be avoided. The pain of losing loved ones, the pain couldn't be avoided. And they had tried so hard to pretend it was okay, but it hurts to lose loved ones. And in this case, that, that moment just come to a head and they couldn't hold it anymore. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane reaches that moment where he can't help it anymore and he falls to his knees in the garden to say, God, I want it my way, but I surrender to yours. 
William Barclay said this text is one of the scariest texts in the New Testament because it shows us the agony inside the heart of God. The heart of God is not making a list and checking it twice and trying to find out who's naughty or nice. That's not the heart of God. The heart of God is not for perfect attendance church pens. That's not the heart of God. There's nothing wrong with that. But you know what the heart of God is? The heart of God is that your heart would become like his heart. That's the heart of God. The heart of God is that your heart would be humbled and broken over your sin and become like his heart. That we would have a heart that cares for our neighbors, a heart that cares for others, a heart that says, God, when church doesn't look like I want it to look, I surrender to your way. When church doesn't go the way I want it to go, God, I surrender to your way. God, when my life doesn't go the way I want it to go, God, I surrender to your way. Because I'm going to tell you something. Every one of y'all are going to face this at some point in your life if you haven't already. You're going to come to a crossroads where you're, want, you're going to want to go east and God's going to make you go west. And it's going to be hard because you're going to be fighting for your way but you know you've got to go God's way. The heart of God is that our hearts would become like His heart. You know what I hear often? But God is unsympathetic to my pain. God doesn't care about my hurt. If he cared about my hurt, he'd take it away. If God loved me so much that he doesn't want me to hurt, then why does he take my hurt away? And many people think God is just this God who's far away. Yeah, he's loving, but he's also wrathful, but he's unsympathetic to me. And that's not, that's not true. It's not true at all. Hebrews 4 verse 15 says this. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. Put that on the screen for you. He says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet is without sin. He literally understands our weaknesses. That God literally understands when you have your garden moment of saying, God, I know you don't want me to do this, but this is what I want, God. But God, help me to surrender to you. There's a reason that the Bible tells us there's a reason that the Bible tells us of Jesus' labor in the garden. Because you and I will have that same labor that leads us to point number two. Point number two shows us the prayer of Jesus. Look at what he says. First, we see him fall on the ground in his pain. Second, his prayer is, if it were possible, this hour might pass from me. If it were possible, this hour might pass from me. But, he says, Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The prayer of Jesus here. We see Jesus the Son praying to the Father. There's an honesty to his prayer. Look at me, church. There's a humility and an honesty to his prayer. You know what God's not looking for? He's not looking for you to, to come to him with a rehearsed prayer. He's not looking to you to come with him for, with the right words. He's just looking for your heart to become like his heart. Prayer is not like a formal book report, church. Prayer is when we, we bear our soul to God so that our heart will become like his heart. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, you know what he said? He taught them to say, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what that means? God, help us here to live like we're going to live there. Satan does not care today, church, if you know about prayer. He does not care if you have a prayer list. He does not care if you study prayer as long as you don't do it he does not care if we have a prayer service as long as we don't pray he doesn't care how much you know about eschatology theology any other ology he doesn't care because when you pray that's when your power is found that's when our hearts are changed that's when we tap into the sources of the eternal and the divine prayer is hard work church we well, see Jesus here laboring in pain, laboring over it. Matter of fact, in Luke chapter 22, verse 44, you know what the Bible says? It says Jesus prayed so much, his sweat became like drops of blood. Literally, that's what the Bible says, Luke 22, 44. And being in anguish, he prayed all the more earnestly that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Jesus labored in, labored in prayer. He sweated drops of blood in prayer. He stayed awake long hours in prayer. He struggled in prayer. But through it, he come to know the will of the Father. Listen, your prayer life cannot be this. God, here's what I want. Give it to me now. 
It must be, God, here's what I want, but help me to surrender to your will. God, I would like this, but if you got something different, help me to be okay with it. God, I really want a spouse, but if you're okay with me being single, if that's what you want. God, I really want a kid, but if you don't want us to have kids, then I'm okay with it. God, I really want another job, but if you want me here, I'm okay with it. Help us to surrender to his will. Jesus labored in prayer in this same manner. Prayer is not always about getting what we want. It's about conforming to the will of the Father. Which leads us to point number three. Number one, you see the pain of Jesus in verse 35. He fell to the ground. You see the prayer of Jesus. But then third, we see the purpose of Jesus. What he says in verse 36. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. The purpose of Jesus was to come and die on your behalf. The purpose of Jesus was to be the final sacrifice on your behalf. The purpose of Jesus was to come to the cross and take your sin. The purpose of Jesus was to bring you into new covenant with God. The purpose of Jesus was to do the will of the Father at all costs. Contrary to popular contemporary American Christianity, God's desire is not just that we have a rousing church service with comfortable amenities while enjoying all the goodies of a first world society. Now there's nothing innately sinful about any of those things, but the problem comes in that we start thinking without those things, somehow we're, not, we're no longer blessed. Listen, we just sang because he lives without a stroke of a piano or a guitar or nothing. If it's all stripped away, church, the screen goes away, the sound goes away, your pew goes away, and you got to sit on the floor. This is not here. This building is not here. Is the gospel still enough? And sometimes we look out and say, God, here's what I want. I want my church to look like this. I want the gospel to look like this. I want my pastor to do this and be this. I want our ministries to be this. But what if God has another plan? Are we okay with saying, God, whatever your plan is, help us be okay with it. John chapter 3, verse 30, the Bible says, I must decrease and he must increase. Oh, how we want that reversed. Oh, how we want to be increased. God, make me a big deal. But we must make much of Jesus. The purpose in this building today, church family, the purpose in this building must be this. The purpose must be, God, have it your way. Did you hear me? The purpose in this building, the purpose in this membership, the purpose in this church must be God have it your way. And all of you in here go, I agree, pastor, until that way is different from your way. Now we got a problem on our hands because God, here's what I want. What if what you want and what God wants are different? Are you willing to say, God have it your way? Stand together this morning. Are you willing to say today, God, have it your way? If not, you need to go to the garden and labor in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for Mount Vernon. Thank you for our community. God, this morning, help us to surrender to your way, even when your way makes no sense to us. God, help us to trust you. Help us to see your pain in the garden, your prayer in the garden, and your purpose for our lives in the garden, that you would offer us salvation through the cross. I pray all this today in Christ's name.